Um, you know, it, kids are so, so important to our body. They are. One of, one of the things that is really uh, appealing to the, about this church is we're truly intergenerational. We truly are. We have, we have uh, young kids, and we've got young families, and we've got uh, middle-aged families, young families like, like me, and middle-aged families and, and older families. And uh, I, I love an intergenerational church because it, it represents the entire family so, so much better. And I'm grateful that the Lord has sent us here as we continue in, the, in this uh, series, this morning uh, I'm going to be sharing with you about unity. And it so happened that my daughter came down this week because Deb had gone through surgery. And so our, our daughter came down from Spokane, Jennifer, and she left this morning before service. She says, I'm sorry, but I got a lot to get, lot to get uh, you know, ready for tomorrow, and it's a four-hour drive, so she kind of took off this morning. But... She's been down here, and she's been kind of helping out, and this morning came out really handy because Deb had to change a dressing on her arm, and I, was, there was, I wasn't going there. She'd have been going to the hospital if Jennifer wouldn't have been here. Not good with that stuff. But, uh, you know, having our daughter here, um, being able to visit, you begin to tell stories about, you know, what it was like when they, when they were, it's just a natural thing, right? Hey, you remember that time we went to the lake? And you remember the time Timmy almost broke his neck? And you remember, you know, you just talk about that stuff. It reminds me of, of when we go home to California. All our family is in, in California. And we go down there and we, you know, the siblings kind of gather. And you've experienced this. You know, you get together with your family, your extended family, and you start telling stories. And it, it is, it's, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great time, usually. It's a, good, it's a good time, and we talk about those, the times we experienced growing up, all those memories. And in so many ways, we're so alike. My brothers and I, I mean, it was the same kind of sense of humor, a little demented, you know, but, but it's but the same kind of sense of humor, and, and we take joy in that. But then we also experience during those times that, we're not all exactly alike. There are some unique qualities that each one of us have, yes? We begin to, we, they're, what they're, if we're together long enough, we begin to get on each other's nerves because, man, he's so picky or she's so whatever. And, and, and as time goes on, we realize that there are differences in us. And as you unified as we are, as, as together we, as we are as a family, we find that there are there are differences. And if we let it, the differences can divide us. And that's true in a family, that's true in a church, that's true in a community, and that's certainly true in our country. When I look at our society, I have to ask myself, how much more divided can we possibly become? Yes? Oh my goodness, you know, just turn on the news and watch for a couple of minutes. We're divided politically. We're divided. Did my battery die? You still hear me okay? Okay, got quiet up here. We're divided politically. We're divided culturally. We're divided morally. We're divided spiritually. Whether it's people see themselves as liberal or or conservative, Democrat, or Republican, whether people believe in abortion or the right to choose, whether we see through the lens of our Bible, whether we see that we have, once we're saved, we're always saved, or whether we look at it and say, look, you can backslide. The fact is we be, have become divided. And to the casual observer, it might seem as though the division is tearing apart the very fabric of our country, if not the world. There's so much hostility these days for those who have grown up a little closer to my age. We think back and it just, it just, 
it seems as though it doesn't even resemble the world that I grew up in. It's not that people didn't disagree, they did. But the division, the depth of the division that we see today is challenging. I remember when I was in high school and hanging out with the guys, they were mostly my brother, my older brother's friends, but but I kind of was, you know, on the outskirts of the group looking in, and I can remember the conversations, the division we had. The division existed of if your family drove Fords or GM. That was the big thing. Were you a Ford guy or were you a GM guy? My dad had always had Pontiacs, so we were kind of a GM family. We thought, you know, Chevys were okay. Pontiacs were it. But Fords, if you drove a Ford, if you thought Fords were cool, oh, man, are you kidding? We could come up with a thousand reasons why Fords were no good. Found on the road dead, right? Ford. Man, those things, would, every time you turn around, they were boiling over and overheating. And like the Fords, no, oh, you wouldn't want that. You'd want a GM. That was our division. That was our great big division. As I began serious about, became serious about riding motorcycles, a diff- the difference was between Harley Davidson and Honda, right? And my brother still, you know, he, he tends to think that Harley, if you don't drive a Harley Di- Davidson, then you're not, there's no reason to ride. And I think I would rather ride my motorcycle than pick up its parts laying across, you know, laying along the, su- the street. So there you are. And though those, those things can seem serious to us, they pale in comparison to the division that we are experiencing today in our society. We now have Oregon and Washington residents seeking, seeking to create an amendment that would secede the East from the West. There are those who would like to get Eastern Washington together with Eastern Oregon and create a state, put a line right there by the mountains, right? You've heard it, you know it. Let's, 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 let's break this up the way we think and feel rather than the way that the natural boundaries are. A woman was in the news this week, you may have seen it, for stabbing herself in the stomach three times. This happened in Florida. She'd stabbed herself in the stomach three times. The police went and they, they, they were called and they went to the scene, asked her what was going on. This isn't political, this is just a reality of what's in the news. She said, I'd rather kill myself than live in Trump's America. All my life, I can remember that my parents either were supportive of the the current president or they weren't happy about it. But the division that we have now is just, it's, it's, it's insane. It seems like we can't get along. It seems like if... If, if I disagree with you or you disagree with me, we can't be friends on Facebook anymore. Well, that's crazy. People isolate themselves. People don't talk to each other because somehow they see things differently, whether, again, whether it's politically or whether it's culturally or morally. There's no sense in getting the, the, the board and writing down a big list because we could be here all day to write out the differences that we see and what, what, what separates us. And, the, and, and although to the person would say this, but this is vitally important to me, we might stand back and say it's so petty. Can we not come together? Can we not sit at the same table because we don't see things the same way? As a pastor, I have to ask the question of myself, how can the church respond to this division? Does the Bible have anything to say about living together in unity in spite of our differences? Is there any hope? Is there any hope? I I believe there is. And as the series title suggests, I believe it begins at home. I do. It's where we teach our children our, our values. It's where we teach our children principles to live by. And so we've looked at a couple of those as the last few weeks. We've looked at humility about serving one another and submitting to one another and seeing others as better than ourselves. And we've looked at love. We've looked at what 
really does mean to love someone, especially your spouse, especially your family, but that translates into our culture. And we've looked at commitment and what it means to be committed to one another. And this morning I want to look at unity. Unity. Years before Paul wrote this letter that we've been looking at, we've been focused on Ephesians 5, the, the few verses of this, this passage in which Paul's speaking of the family. But years before, when Paul arrived in Ephesus on his second missionary journey, it says that Paul found some believers there. He found some believers. And so he began to share with them. He began to question them about what they had heard and what they believed. And together they began to study God's Word. They didn't have this. We had the fresh revelation of Jesus. And they had the Torah. And together they began to study. He had gone to the to the synagogue. There was a synagogue there in the town. And he preached there for three months, but he began to run up against the, the opposition of the, the Jewish leaders who were not yet ready to receive the gospel. And so he left there with some of the disciples, those who wanted to learn more. And he said he went to the hall of Tyrannus. It was a teaching hall, like going to the Grange Hall, I suppose. And, and there they met for the next two years. And Paul worked with them and he taught them and he grew the church. He founded the church in Ephesus and got it on its feet. In Acts chapter 20, verse 19 to 21, Paul was on his way to Jerusalem and he had been in Macedonia and as he came back through, um, he was stopped. He stopped in Ephesus or he stopped in Miletus and called the elders to him from Ephesus and in verses in verses 19 it says serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and trials which befell me through the plots of the Jews how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public from house to house and then he goes on and he says that tells them that there's coming a time at which others will spring up even from among yourselves which will, lie, will try to separate you from the flock. He warns the elders that there will be those who will come and try to divide the flock one against the other, mostly Jews against Gentiles, but they will try to divide them. And so he warns them before he takes off and goes to Jerusalem. Years later, as we come to this letter, Paul is writing... And as he does, he spends a great deal of the letter speaking about unity, about the need for unity, for them to see them, the, themselves as belonging to one body, for they are members of one another. And although they have a different perspective on what the gospel is, they're called to live together in unity and, and, and prefer one to another. And then he comes to this portion in five that we've been focused on. And in that, he uses the marriage and the family as an example of how to live together in unity. Paul writes in verse 21, Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. 22, Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be subject in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Even so, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. For he who loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. He's using the family. He's using the marriage to say, we're one. We're one body. We're one family. 
We're members of one another. We need to stand in unity and, and not allow ourselves to be divided. As husbands are to love their wives, we are to love one another as Christ loved us. As husbands are called to be committed to their husband, to their wife, we are called to be committed to one another as Christ is committed to us. In verse 31, he continues, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is a profound one, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. I want to stop and say a word of prayer. I believe that the, the unity in our life, within our family, within our church, within our country is so, so very important. And I want to make sure that I ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning about this topic even as I speak. Father God, we pray that you would send your Spirit among us. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak through my lips. I ask that as I share the words, that you would interpret them into our heart. Help us to understand, help us to believe, and help us to put into practice that which we hear from you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Paul quotes from Genesis 2.24 when he says, For this reason a man will leave his wife and he will be joined to his... Uh, a man will leave his... Sorry. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and will be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. I want to read just a little bit leading up to that statement that he, that he quotes because there is a context. Moses tells us, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every beast of the field, but for the man there was not found a helper fit for him. And so the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of the ribs and closed it up its place with flesh. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And then the man said, This is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Verse 24, Therefore a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife, and they both become one flesh. Sometimes in reading this, we tend to look over the fact that she was taken out of man. Well, what does that mean? What's, what's significant about that? Here's what's significant. When God created us, he didn't create Adam and then create Eve. Are you following me? He created Adam and then out of Adam he fashioned Eve. God did not create two separate races, two separate entities. He created man, male and female, this, the scripture tells us. But he made us all out of one, out of Adam. We find ways to be divided enough as it is. God created us out of one parent. We say that we came from Adam and Eve, and yes, we did, but we all came out of Adam. Do you follow what I'm trying to say? that there's a special significance that Eve was created out of Adam rather than being created separately from him. We're one. We're one. We're all made of the same stuff. 
Somebody has said that they have done a DNA test. I don't know how they did this, but somebody said they've done a DNA test, and it says that we come all the way back from one person. But it's true. That's true. It's so tempting to look at someone and see them as different. And because they're different, they're less than. We look at someone, if we drive a Ford and they drive a Chevy, we say, well, they're less than because they drive a Chevy. Or because they ride a Harley Davidson. Or because they have a career or a job that we wouldn't consider. We look at people who are different from us, whether it's because of a disability or a skin color or whatever. And that's the truth, or whatever. And we say they're different, and because they're different, they're less than, and I'm more than. And it creates division among us. I have one brother. I have one full brother. And I was raised with two half-brothers and a half-sister. So had my mother or had my parents or even if my siblings would have focused on the fact that they were halves, it would have created division in the family, yes? We can think of a blended family. We were never even allowed, well, we were never taught, we were never, it was never exemplified to us at all that my younger brothers and sisters were not full brothers and sisters. My dad also remarried, and he had three children, and so those are my half-brothers. But I don't think of them as my half-brothers my half-sisters. They're my brothers and sisters. It seems natural to us to find the differences that we have with other people and then begin to focus on that. And as we do that, that begins to divide us. And one of the ways to regain unity is to realize that we're all out of the same stuff. We're all people. We all, what's the saying? Put one, put our pants on one leg at a time. We're just people. And we have more in common than we have of distinction. We have the same heritage. We're also called a maturity. Paul writes, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. We'll leave our father and mother, and that's when we gain maturity. At least it's hoped that we will. Why? Because when we leave our parents, then we begin to process all that we have learned from them, and then we make the decision what we truly believe for ourselves. Because when we're home, when we're living in our mom and dad's home, there are rules and expectations that are upon us because we're in their home. And there are behaviors and there's beliefs that we're expected to conform to. But conformity requires strict adherence to belief and behavior, whereas unity requires authentic freedom. Authentic freedom. We don't become ourselves until we decide for ourselves what we truly believe and put that into practice. Yes? It's part of the growing up process. That I grew up in this home and I was taught this and I was taught to think this and believe that. But it's not till I leave my parents and I live on my own that I begin to think about what I believe for me. And the reality is that when I come to that point where I believe and I choose this belief for myself, that becomes my very own belief. And when I'm strong in that, it allows me to give others the freedom to have a different perspective without feeling threatened. And not feeling threatened, but giving people permission to believe what they believe allows us to come to the table and have unity. I can sit at the table with my brothers and sisters who see some things differently than I do, and I can love them. I can sit at the table with my grown children 
There are things that they see differently than I do, but I can sit at the table with them and I can respect them as being grown people who have made their own choices, their own decisions about what they believe, and I can love them. And we can have unity together because we're all we're all mature, we're all grown-ups. With our children at home, we have, we have a responsibility to teach them, but there comes a time that we need to allow them to become who they are. Psychologists talk about the difference between enmeshment and individuation. Enmeshment means that we're still completely connected, enmeshed, in our relationship with our parents and what they want from us. And it makes it hard for us to stand on our own and choose for ourselves. But as we grow, a natural progression is that we individuate. That is, that we become ourselves. It's a healthy thing. I remember when uh, Deb and I would, had gotten to Colville, and we'd been there for a while, a couple years, and one of the couples came to me one time, seems like it was after church, I don't remember, I just remember they, they, they came up to me in the parking lot and they said, Pastor, we're really concerned for you. And I said, you are? He says, yeah, well, it's about Deb. It's about Deb? He says, we don't think she shows you enough respect. <laughs> I'm like, cool, maybe you want to go have a conversation with her. <laughs> that would be just awesome for me. <laughs> and I kind of laughed, and they didn't know what to think, you know. And I said, well, Deb's her own person, and that's okay with me. I mean, part of it, is, part of it was cultural, right? We had grown up in L.A., and there's a different culture there. And we went to this little town of Colville. It was very traditional. It was very, you know, conservative. And, 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 and the gals were expected, for the most part, not to work. And if they did, but they were still, still expected, well, I won't go down that road. But you know what I'm saying. And he looked at Deb and the way that she responded to me. And they could tell that she had her own mind, which she does. And I had to just have this short conversation with them and say, I love that my wife thinks for herself. I love that she's intelligent and she's wise. That she's secure in herself enough to be who she is. And we don't always agree on everything, but you know what? We're united. We're united. Because we have the freedom to be who we are, then we can love and appreciate one another. We can care for one another. One of my pastors growing up down in L.A., he told each one of his sons, he had three sons, and he told each one of his sons that when they got married, his desire for them was that they would move away, find a home in another place. And that seemed odd to me. And I think, why would you want your sons to leave? He says, because until they leave and they're out from under our constant uh, in influence, they can't become their own family. And I want them to become their own family with their own traditions and their own values and their own... I want them to believe what they believe because they believe it. And I want them to live it because they want to live it and not in order to keep mom and ha dad happy. And so he sent them out. And each one of them did. They moved to an area far away, northern California, Oregon, Washington. When Deb and I went to Warner to go to school, and then from there we went to Colville, it was four of us. And I began to experience what my pastor Kernet was trying to tell us at that time. That by being the, just the four of us, we began to build a unity of our family that our identity was found in one another and not in the larger family. And it became a healthy thing. It can be done in an unhealthy way, but it doesn't have to be. Because we can come back as adults and be solidly united and in spite of our differences 
a perspective, an opinion. Thirdly, we discover a new identity. We discover a new, new identity when we become one flesh. That is, we're no longer, we no longer live for ourselves alone. That was a process for me. I've told you before, I tend to be selfish. I'm just being real with you. That throughout my life, I've tended to be selfish. That's my struggle. That's my challenge. So I think of the things that I want, the life that I want, the job that I want to drive truck. I want to drive truck. And so without really going through the process and allowing Deb to make a decision whether that's something that as a family that I should do, I'm off to drive a truck because I want to drive a truck. And I want a motorcycle, so I get a motorcycle. And for far too long, my decisions were made about what I want to do. Why? Because I didn't, had not yet come to the conclusion that I have a new identity. And my in, new identity was us instead of me. Does that make sense? I had to come to the point of understanding that now I'm a part, one flesh with Deb. And that's when I became, began to become us. Do we make decisions for what is right for us instead of what is right for me? We've had some good, we've had some good habits, we were told by a counselor at one point, because we like to do things together. But I suspect most of it was because Deb just went along with it. But we're getting to the point of growing together in a healthy way. Unity brings depth and strength when we become one. I was going through school. I was in my senior year at uh, Warner. It was 1988. It was October. And if you don't know what October 1988 means to a Dodger fan, you don't know enough. The Dodgers played the Oakland A's for the World Series in 1988, and Oral Hershiser was the pitcher. And my professor, one of my professors, his, he was a Chicago guy. And he went on and on and on about how the Dodgers didn't have a chance of winning the World Series because they only had one player that was worth his salt. And I said, that's where you're wrong. He says, you have other players that are worth their salt? I says, no, but that's not the reason we're going to win. We're going to win because... They don't have any outstanding people, and they will pull together as a team, and they will stand as one. If you don't know your history, the Los Angeles Dodgers won in four straight games. They won the World Series as one team because they stood together. Unity gives us so much more strength than being an individual and standing on my own. And Deb and I have gone so much farther because we have learned to stand together as one. Finally, we will find reconciliation. Paul says that this is a mystery, but I'm referring to Christ and the church. Paul makes it clear earlier in chapter 2 that he's that we were once aliens and foreigners, but because of Christ's grace and forgiveness, we have become one, one in him. Through reconciliation, through forgiveness, what does that have to do with us? It means that we need to confess when we have hurt someone, when we have broken trust, when we have sinned, and we need to ask for forgiveness. And when others have hurt us and they ask for forgiveness we need to grant it unity comes through reconciliation unity comes when we when we recognize that we are made of the same stuff and that we all fail that we all have feet of clay that we're every one of us has imperfections and we humble ourselves Unity comes when we love one another enough to overlook the faults and we support one another. Unity comes when we're committed to one another. So no matter what we walk through, 
We walk through it together. And unity comes when we forgive. Paul closes with these words. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Love and respect. Love and respect. As we look at the disunity, as we look at the division in the world today, where do we see love and respect? I don't see very much of it on TV. I don't see very much of it on the news. I don't see respect. I don't see respect for our president. And that's not being, that, that has nothing to do with his, his, his political stance. It's just the office that he has. I don't see respect for, for one another at all. The church has something to give to the world. It does. When we raise our children to be humble, when we raise our children to love one another, to be committed to one another, when we raise our children and to see themselves as part of one family, and one with another, that can bleed outward through the church into the community and into the world. It can. It has. It has. And it can do it again. The disciples, those 12 disciples, turned the world upside down. You know how they did it. It wasn't because of their theology. It wasn't because of their political views. It was because the people watched the people of the church. The, the people in the world watched the people of the church and they said, see how they love one another. And they turned the world upside down. It can still happen. We have that responsibility to be those people. Pray with me. Father God, our desire, our desire is to so resemble your person. Our desire is to be so filled with you that everywhere we go and every person that we talk to, that we represent you accurately meaning your love and your grace, but also your holiness and your challenge, your calling, that you call us to a higher place, to be committed in humility to loving one another. And help us, Father, also to get past our defensiveness of, of insisting that other people believe as we do. For we're not called to we're not called to a certain theology, but rather we're called to love you. Recognizing the place that proper interpretation has, still we are called to reflect your love and to, and to lead people to you and trust the Holy Spirit to work on their heart for what is right and what is wrong. Help us, we pray, to honor you and and draw people to you, and to do our part to draw people to unity. I pray this in the name of your Spirit. Amen.